Hey everyone. Thank well, you well. for tuning in to this our session panel. Uh, the panel is about building a games portfolio for the future. Um, basically, f we're going to be talking about how we can curate and create portfolios, which help us be more successful when we're trying to enter the industry. Before we dive in, though, I think a quick round robin of introductions. Um, my name's Alex Beddows. I'm the senior environment artist at Respawn. Also host the GDD podcast. And previously worked with uh, Microsoft The Initiative, uh, Counterplay Games, and Decagon. Uh, I'm Jacob Norris. I uh, also worked in games for about 11 years now. And I started off at Insomniac, moved over to Kojima Productions, uh, as well as Naughty Dog. And then most recently, I was at NVIDIA. And now I'm freelancing. Hello. Uh, you guys can hear me okay, I assume. Yeah, Alex smiling. Okay. Hi. Uh, I'm Jeremiah Estrelato. I'm a lead level artist at Massive Entertainment at Ubisoft Studio. I've been doing games for about 14 years now. And uh, in my free time, I'm pushing education in the game art space uh, for the Dynasty Empire. Looks like I'm the only one missing a mustache. <laughs> no, we're doing it wrong. It's it's December now. We're past. We're past yeah, we're supposed to remove it. Yeah. We were supposed to remove it. Removed. Yeah. Um. So, like Alex mentioned, we're gonna go through some people's portfolios. Uh, just talk about like what's good to build out your portfolio. And so we picked a couple people that we felt represented some of the different environment artist roles pretty well. And we just wanted to say beforehand, like, even if uh, the specific role we're talking about for your portfolio isn't what you were trying to show off with that role, uh, we just wanted to share your portfolio because you had some beautiful work on there. And we felt that uh, it did represent whatever we felt that we were trying to show with that. Um, so, yeah, it's it's going to be a lot of fun, I think. One thing just to let everyone know, um, even though we are three environment artists, um, Game art is a ridiculously big uh, grouping of, of careers. You've got anything from environment art, character art, VFX, tech, cinematics, um, concept art. So although we are environment artists, the stuff that we're going to be talking about, you're going to be able to abstract out and apply to any of these fields. We're not going to be getting into the nitty gritty of um, like pipelines and all these sorts of things regarding environment art. Uh, we're going to be talking about rules on how we create portfolios that can, that are cross discipline. Um, now to start with, it's, a lot of people think about this already. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to share uh, some portfolios. So, People already talk about, like when they're talking about curating a portfolio, the first question that tends to come up is stylized or realism. And these are two fantastic examples of both, Victor Ullman and uh, Jasmine's portfolio. They, it's kind of, that's where people start, right? They go, oh, okay, I'm, am I going to be stylized or am I going to be realism? As if it's a binary thing. I mean, it's not. St stylized ranges anywhere from, uh, you know, God of War-esque stuff to Animal Crossing. Like, it's, it, it isn't just an on and off switch. Uh, but these are some, you know, obvious examples where people tend to start for uh, sort of giving their, their portfolio a bit of direction. Yeah, I mean, like, even look at, you know, some of the great original artists, where like uh, Picasso started off with realism and then moved into this kind of, strange stylized interesting look so it's not to say that you can only do one or the other but uh, it is a good idea at least to show the type of work that you're hoping to get a, a job in because then if you have the a strange mix of things and maybe you're not able to put your full attention to one or the other for enough time to really kind of get a good understanding of a stylized look you're going for and kind of nail your own style or nail that kind of realism effect as well you remember too is uh, these two artists started just like everyone starts right so it's mm -hmm. these two portfolios when you look at them are like top tier in the in this direction mm -hmm. uh, in, in their in their uh, specific directions but i mean you have to start with a cube right <laughs> you get <laughs> yeah. you start with that cube and then you delete it to empty your scene so you can figure out what the heck's going on well I can give you guys an example as well, like just to sort of help hammer this point home a little bit. Uh, I don't mind doing this. This is my my portfolio from 2017, um, and this is actually this was during one of Jeremy's portfolio reviews. Uh, 
But as you can see, it's kind of a uh, it's a mishmash. It's very directionless. Uh, I've got some like sci-fi stuff. I have some stylized work. I have some weapon eye. I have some text shaders, and it's, I'm kind of not making any real progress in any real direction. Um, so just to help illustrate the point that we're talking about, this is kind of what we're getting at. Um, we're saying you know find a bit of that first bit of direction just so you can help make like meaningful progress in a particular direction i think is really important yeah it's definitely about focusing on a, a specific it's not to like limit you as well right because you could be doing realistic for a while and then just start doing stylized stuff on the side and you mm -hmm. can shift mm -hmm. you can move around it's not like when you make a choice uh you're locked into it but you can really see with these two that like because they've put so much effort into the style that they have chosen it really shows in the quality of the work as well yes. i mean like um yeah you can go to some of wichter's earlier stuff and definitely see the the evolution of his artwork as it comes through um and like some of these last images and starting from like rebirth and, and things after that like these are just incredible scenes um and uh, you know like <laughs> you can even take something like he, he did the world of warcraft scene and yeah take something that was stylized and turn that into realism and I mean, so it's like a painting that's the that's the funny thing is i think um we talk about stylized i mean you could say this is still stylized i think a lot of people think of stylized and i think like you said world of warcraft but you when we look at when we actually start to dissect games and look at them objectively like i said god of war is not a hyper realistic game it's a it, there is artistic decisions made yeah, and stylization made um and i think starting to understand i think as artists when you start to understand this more and you can start to be more deliberate in what you do with your portfolio i think you really start to curate something um and that's kind of the gist of this whole panel is like this is the start point like this is where most people get to when they're talking about picking a direction um but in you know these are environment artists and an environment artist is a very broad term like when you actually break down how different studios handle the role, you've got anything from um, generalist world builders, props artists, texture artists, hard surface people, lighting, programmetry, tech. It's like it. There's a lot of different directions you can go. And through this panel, I think we're going to hopefully unpack some of this and give good examples of these different directions that are, and possibilities for us. Um, so I think we should probably start off. We've sort of tackled that from a high level perspective, the, the stylized and realism. Uh, I think we should start with our first first portfolio to so uh, with a general direction. You guys good with that? Yeah, yeah, yeah sounds good. Sounds good. Uh, I'll really quickly throw this out there because I know I hear it a lot from people too. Like they're mm -hmm. worried about maybe showing scenes that are only mega scans or all mega scans in their portfolios. Um, but I think uh, just as a good example, like Wichter's work relies heavily on mega scans because he's working, you know, with Epic and, and Quixel and he's taking that and turning it into something that's his own because of adding a couple uh, unique and, and original pieces that he, he uses in there as well. And so, you know, I just wanted to mention that because like don't stray away from practicing with mega scans or, or trying uh, things that are, are already created, even just packs like on the marketplace or things like that, because it all mm -hmm. still comes down to the composition that you can make with it and the lighting and just the beautiful artistry that you can get from that. Yeah, it, it allows you to get to uh, like the the core of like what what we, I guess I would call like artistic fundamentals and you're just looking at composition and lighting and like you already have all the assets to play with or you can use those assets to supplement what you're already building. Yeah. And you have to integrate those as well into your scene. They're not going to like usually match right off of the go. So we'll start from the sort of broader sense of environment arts and we'll narrow ourselves down. So the first portfolio what we we're looking at is John Joe Hemmons, um, environment artist at Rocksteady. Um, I think this when people think of environment artists, I think this is the kind of portfolio they have in mind. A lot of time it's like there's bits of lighting, there's bits of props, there's foliage, there's organic stuff, there's um, man-made stuff. And I think I think a long I think maybe you guys have been in the industry a lot longer than me, but I think a long time ago, I think generalist probably people would frown upon that that term. But I think now with like the way a lot of some studios go, it's being a well-rounded artist is very, very good. And I think John is a great example of this where he's 
very good in multiple fields, whether that's materials, foliage, but he's excellent, a texturized. I know Jacob probably, uh, you know, you, you're the texture guy here. I, you're, uh, you're very videos. <laughs> so I think you let you talk to this a little bit more. Yeah. Um, I was just going to kind of mention like, like this idea that, uh, yeah, as he has a few different types of, of works in here, it's really interesting too, that if you create environments, not only then can you do that, you can come in and show your skills with these super refined individual props as well. Like when you check out his eighties vending machine, like this is one of those assets where you could tell he just went like total ham on that thing and just pushed it as far as he could. Like, you know, total uh, OCD status, just getting each of all the little like scratches and edge wear and the it's that material. It's the material storytelling. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. storytelling is, is beautiful. And there were people, um, that we had like worked with as, as freelancers with NVIDIA where their whole portfolio was a single prop, but the prop was just so incredibly well done and, and curated that we're like, oh my gosh, all right, we have to at least try this artist out a bit for freelance or something because this is beautiful. So um, as a generalist, I think it's good, you know, showing off all those different things. And um, just for me personally, because I really enjoy those high quality individual assets too it's it's nice to have maybe some prop work in there or like he has the foliage work here and um yeah there's some things from the nvidia marbles demo right there where each of those individual ones he just was able to go into all that fine grain detail and it's kind of nice to show that you can do that if if you are going on like a yeah. smaller scale uh, or hero props it's great to show off that it's kind of like all these are hero props you could say that, I, uh, so from, oh, on, yeah. Jeremy? No, I was just gonna say like when you look at the 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 rtx scene for uh the marbles uh work it's very like i i mean chat's probably gonna laugh at me because i always say this but the roughness variation you get all the different types of materials mm. and you're you're seeing those like and how they work together and how they how the materials react to like the same type of paint that's going from over the a piece of wood to yes. how it affects metal and just yeah. getting all of those materials to talk to each other, it's uh, it's really impressive. I think yeah. something that I find really interesting about this as well is props, I've, especially with the the addition of the, his his hemlock forest is a you know it's a great scene, and from an environmental point of view, like it's, the composition, everything's fantastic. But something I really liked about the foliage edition is being a strong props artist, like plants and foliage is props too like you know it's uh, it's showing that skill set and the fact that you can tackle anything from these you know hard surface uh, vending machines to very small assets of them them uh, figurines on your desk to foliage and trees and it's like the funny thing is when you think of this type of portfolio as well it's one of the hardest to do and the long it takes the longest to curate because you need to be proficient in multiple areas um it's not like you can just go like all in on one sector and just own it. Like John's had to get into material work, props work, um, all the foliage stuff. Like it's all, it requires time. And that's, I think that's the biggest problem with, I guess, portfolio work in general. It is kind of an additive issue. Like you just, it's the time invested. So to get yeah. to this type of portfolio where you are able to tackle pretty much anything, it takes a, a lot of time. That's because yeah, well, you've had to it. tackle it, right? Yeah, 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 and that's what that's what makes it so so good. Actually, these yeah. days, as a generalist, is then uh, if they are hiring for a specific role like uh, texture art or or modeling, um, or like world building, something like that, then you can apply to any of the roles you want. Like the the world is your oyster at that point because you can do all these things. Um, and uh, many teams are are even having like just kind of small crews, like a lot of. A lot of startups are doing that or even uh, tech companies and even at like nvidia we only had seven artists so it's very small teams and you kind of have to be a generalist in some of these cases because you yeah. will need to jump on and off many different aspects of the work so i think this is probably a good time to we've we're talking about generalists so like you know this is john's way he's got um, organic environments man-made environments always props always foliage so that's the high, that's the broadest sense when we think of an environment artist. But 
there's not all there is to it. Like there are, we, you can go, you can get really finite with it and you can go further and further down. Whereas people who focus purely on props and one of my favorite props artists is Mario. I mean, for me personally, as just someone purely, uh, someone looking at art, this is some of my favorite work personally. Um, but it's like, you look at this person's portfolio, you 100% get what, what it is, yeah what it is he wants to do um he wants to make props he wants to make assets and you start to see kind of from a high level i guess what we're talking about here with you curate your portfolio to what you want to do yes. if you're not interested in making foliage don't have foliage on your portfolio if you're not interested in making whole levels don't have whole levels on your portfolio but mario honestly i, I love look at this work and it's just uh it's interesting because yeah. it's so like the the asset you're looking at right now, it's so simple yet mm -hmm. so well executed. You don't you don't it have really to do is. a crazy scene to just like to show that off. And then also when you just look at the entire portfolio, it's very much like a you're like okay this this person really likes the technical understanding of how things are put together, how stuff interacts with each other, and just how like. Like the uh, the circuit breaker, for example, like the moment it's like, oh yeah, you're scrolling down and it, it pops open, and you're looking at all of these oh, wires, man. and it just works. It works the way that it's supposed to, and you see like like I don't even know what these. I only open these when I blow out like power in half of the apartment. Like, <laughs> turn on, so turn when on you, five computers at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Like oh no, um, but like looking at this you can immediately understand what you're looking at and, and see all yeah. the little extra details that are being put in there yeah i think um on top of that as well it's one thing which for me personally anyway like it's you can get as the like you can i guess you can get as detailed as you like but it's either within just the like hard surface prop component of it the definition in the materials even though there's a lot of metal in here it's you know that you we just looked at a circuit breaker the difference between that and say this fan and it's like just the quality and the read of all the materials like you really sh it shows real mastery and i think that's something like if you, again if that's the direction you want to go where you want to make out you know you're just interested in pumping out assets um this is a great example of it yeah, so something I'll just throw out there uh, that I kind of notice a lot when people are creating props. This is portfolio related, but also just art related. Um, that something to pay attention to a lot with your your models specifically, because a lot of people get a lot of great imperfections in their texture work, uh, a lot of nice like storytelling and edge wear and grunge. But many people tend to forget that most things aren't like perfect. Like panels are always kind of slightly mismatched or like a piece of plastic is slightly bent or warped or people like dent things and run into things. Uh, and so it can be good to make sure like you don't have too many straight edges everywhere. Uh, or if you're having like spacing on like a railing or a bar that there's like maybe some some bend or the, even the scale is, is fluctuating and stuff. Like all these miniature imperfections go a long way to selling that idea of realism when it comes to your models and your props. Yeah, the, the, there's another question that I, I just kind of saw pass through in mm -hmm. chat as well. It's like, mm -hmm. well, why, why put in all these small details when you, when you're applying for game development positions? And I think, uh, for me, the answer is it helps me understand when I look at it and, and looking at a portfolio with all these details helps me understand how much you truly understand PBR or how, how much you care about the, how stuff is put together. Because a lot of the times, maybe you have to, let's say that fuse box is going to be in a game, right? And it doesn't uh -huh. show the inside ever. So it's just closed. But understanding how a fuse box is positioned on a wall and where it connects and like those details alone can only be found through like heavy reference gathering and understanding the assets that you're building. So it's yeah. even if you can't get this type of fidelity for say a real time scenario, it's it's really important, I think, to fully understand what you're what you're building, and it shows to the people that are employing you, uh, your, I don't I don't want to say commitment, but your your 
obsessive uh, interest <laughs> in, <laughs> in the fine details. Because you're it's, you're hiring the artist, right? So yes. It's like yeah, yeah. as long as you can see that they have incredible artwork, you know that they can make this uh, a five twelve or two fifty six resolution version of that and uh, get as much detail as they can into that as well. If they can do it at this crazy four K or eight K scale, so well, it's a lot easier to dial back. Than it is. It's a lot easier to say to an artist who understands this to such an extreme level to say, okay, you can just pull back 80% because we need this done quickly or whatever. But it's a lot harder if you're like, okay, I need to teach you now how to take the something that a little, that a little bit further. And also, like you said, it's all about understanding. Like, even though, like I said, you may not be able to get this higher fidelity um, on an optimized, like, shipped game, it's the understanding of how something wears and breaks down you're showing to the person looking at your portfolio oh okay they get it they know what they're doing like i can see that they're thinking about how they're making their prop rather than you know oh if i just throw a generic grunge on out of like painters like default masks that will do because it's going to get optimized anyway like this just shows that extra level of understanding and you can have a dialogue then like if that person is thinking that heavily about this you can have a conversation and you're both speaking the same language and you can sort of get to that point. Whereas if that person, if the person doesn't understand all this stuff and you're trying to explain something, it can be a little bit more difficult, I think. Like a nuclear physicist can still go back and do two plus two, you know? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> 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 I, remember, I remember that one nice uh, <laughs> i i don't know man have we ever asked no, that's amazing i'm saving that so let's flip on his head so we've looked at what someone we get really finite down into like individual assets if we're on the flip side you got someone like martin hoff um big I've, i think a lot of us especially me and you jeremy being from the dynasty community like big fan of martin's work and i think he's a great example of somebody who clearly has an inclination to world building um and also you mentioned this earlier jacob uh, um, regarding mega scans i think martin's portfolio not necessarily mega scans but asset packs in general mm -hmm. is a great example for anybody who asks that question oh can i use mega scans you can look through Martin's work and it's very hard to or near impossible to go, oh, that's mega scan and that isn't. Like he the line yeah, he's, his quality is there. Whereas I think when you see a portfolio where I can clearly see the mega scan assets and I can clearly see your assets, I think that's when the, the whole mega scan conversation can get a bit bit dicey. But the world building here, I mean, honestly, I love it. It's fantastic. And yeah, like you said, it's tough to really spot the, where the mega scans are in any of his work. So that's like the great mm -hmm. way of taking it and making it super unique in your own scene from it. And um, that's like the intention that they have with mega scans to begin with. Is it just supposed to aid you in creating mm -hmm. the artwork you want to make and make it beautiful from there? Yeah, that his his uh, speed of building scenes is kind of terrifying. When I yes, every time he posts <laughs> something, I'm like, what the heck? Like. <laughs> And, the, and it's his attention to detail. He goes from like large to small. And I think a lot of the the things that when you look at a, a, a scene overall, um, it's those small details where you're like, how the heck? How? And yeah, I mean, some of those are some of those are likely scans that, you know, had had been authored and, and worked on uh, till they blended in with the scene to the point where you, you couldn't even tell the difference between that and and other assets. <laughs> I think this so if you're if you're somebody who is really interested in the world building side of things, I think these sorts of shots as well, where you have your like environment and it's like this is a beautiful environment, great job. And you show how you built it with like what was your kit that you built it. From my perspective, especially stuff like this, from my perspective, I'm like, okay, like this is how these are the Lego pieces he used to create this whole scene it weren't like every single thing's individually unique and then in that case like okay you're you're then asking the question as a recruiter well can they do the proper world building modularity that's required and that's sensible like stuff like this is a great way to show that you understand how to world build efficiently mm. like Did only you? just now i didn't even realize that um it, or is it it might be is this the the basketball court from from decagon or is this uh, no no oh okay okay <laughs> that is a great scene as well though okay it wasn't sure 
the the abandoned theater even in the description his his goal was to create a, a project to get more familiar with unreal 4 and an extensive use of mega scans library <laughs> you and can't it it's not like you look at this and go yeah oh, you don't feel it your your props yeah. stand out like a sore thumb yeah you don't feel it at all all right so it's i mean this is the if you're looking to be i think the thing actually the thing i do really enjoy as well is the the i guess every scene has like a vibe to it and mm. it's quite consistent i think there's something i do i actually quite enjoy about martin's work is you come for certain quality and again you can see a direction to the portfolio it's not like um they are all ancient ruins, right? And we go, oh, okay, like this person clearly wants to work on fantasy Nordic stuff. So you know, it's all urban, it's all quite de um, decrepit. You're like, okay, like there's a direction to his portfolio. And it's probably no accident he's a massive on Division 2. It's like you look <laughs> at his portfolio work and then you look at you know his production work, you're like, ah, I see a correlation here, like how <laughs> this has led you to a path. Um, and this is why it's so important to build like your portfolio with intent. Cause if you hated doing this kind of stuff, you don't want to then end up in a job doing it for, you know, eight, nine hours a day. You want to be doing something you actually want to do. Definitely. Yeah. So we're going to go on to, uh, <laughs> get ready for the R station. Lots of material balls. No, Ben Wilson's, <laughs> I mean, this is for ben me, someone who is. Too. <laughs> oh, nice. So for me personally, I'm sorry, Ben, you're going to have to listen to me good for a sec. But in terms of material artists, I mean, I'm very into material art. Probably my favorite <laughs> material art portfolio. Um, I think one of the qualities, just speaking purely about it for a second, is with material art, you look at any of his posts, I don't look at it and go, I can't reverse engineer that and go, I know exactly yes. how he did that with these nodes. It's like, I just look at that and it's a piece of art um this is what you know when we're looking at Look, material art this is what we want to see mm. oh dude it's so and it, the funny thing yeah. is you can go on substance share and download this and uh <laughs> see it it's it's really bizarre but this I is mean, a field this is like a whole field right like the yeah. I, I think at least um i've seen it often that it's it's easier sometimes to create a beautiful model unless you're going like full like hard surface and design and all that but it's easier sometimes to create a beautiful model and then like accidentally ruin it with bad texturing and having yeah. having having like those incredible uh materials it's just so beautiful to look at like Dude. i mean I i'm biased though because i'm kind of more of a texture artist i i enjoy looking at this like <laughs> you can put these on so many surfaces too like these are things that you can reuse a lot it's not as specific necessarily as uh creating like yeah hero props or hero models or things like that like if, if you build up a library for yourself of some of these ground textures and wall textures and unique like sci-fi textures it's so easy to go back and grab those and then start mm -hmm. to make scenes out of them and create spaces with these tiling textures and blending them with vertex painting and things in ue4 so it, it can be really modeling, versatile right? to have that where, where you save oh, those fair. pieces right yeah and you're just kind of you can build on top of yourself uh with all all the stuff that you've already created yeah um, kid bashing yeah 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 his man ben's banner is kind of like it's like grossly beautiful <laughs> i don't know that little <laughs> one man i don't know i don't know what it feels wrong we what is it? It's, uh, I don't even know what that is. But it almost feels like a, is a good example. reptile scales or something. Uh, <laughs> One thing that's a know. really important yeah, example for people to see as well is so with Ben's portfolio, someone knows. So he's currently working in tech art now. And you can see with his portfolio, like the way it's structured, you see his, it's almost tiered in his interests. So his yep. tech stuff's at the top. And it, if I'm coming to his portfolio, that's the first thing I see. It's like, okay, that's that's the person's main interest. In my opinion, this is how I view portfolios. Your top stuff is like, okay, this is my bread and butter. This is what I want to do. And clearly then there's like a bunch of material balls. But like, 
I think this ordering says a lot about the artist's portfolio. If, there's, um, if you have nothing but materials first and then there's a couple of environments at the end, it's like, oh, clearly this person's main interest is towards materials. Um, if you had like nothing but props and then there's like maybe, again, maybe an environment at the end, it's like, okay, clearly this person wants to make props. Um, but I, I think this sort of, it sometimes goes unnoticed, but I think this sort of structuring, it, it can... Maybe it's subconscious and maybe it's a suit it's like a one percent thing that, you know, is barely noticeable, but it makes it in my opinion it makes a big difference just to tell it, tell people what they're looking at without them having to explicitly ask you, I think is very helpful. I, yeah, I think so. And, and yeah. when you scroll when you scroll all the way down, like you're you're like, All right, now you start seeing the games and yeah, man, the break the breakdowns in those are crazy. So definitely the look people. at those if you haven't. But the, uh, these are amazing. Yeah, they're they're insane. But then it's almost as you keep going down, you start to see uh, what Ben likes to do. I would argue in his pastime now, which is more like spread the knowledge and and speak at events and and show techniques and just spreading information and teaching people. It's it's present even in the portfolio. Yeah, yeah. like if if you're looking to to hire him um, and you are looking for a texturist, then or even a tech texturist because of those nodes up in the front immediately mm -hmm. when you come here it's just bam right in your face this this is the person for it and then as kind of like an extra bonus you keep going down and you start to see environments and so like you mentioned setting it up in that in that order of what you're looking to get is is huge for people viewing it because first impressions send a lot um and he, and th this is something that people often say but we haven't said it this talk um and i'll just repeat it is that like make sure to take out like your worst work because you know your portfolio is only as good as your worst work because there's also people i've gone through when looking to hire some and then i'll get to, to one of the works and it's maybe a little bit more recent because i'll give them a benefit of doubt if it's older and it's not so good and sometimes that then i'll almost just like close the portfolio because maybe i have 10 or 20 other ones to, to look through and so when you're going fast like that, if you spot something that's not up to par with the rest of your work, just just take it out. How this for my this is more of an interesting question for me because I it I, I like from a perspective of I like seeing old work if it's like a this is where it was and it's where I'm now. Maybe that belongs more in a blog mm -hmm. post. But what you said that you give after a certain yeah. amount of time you give them the benefit of the doubt. How yeah. roughly how long is that period? You would be like I'll give you the benefit of doubt. Like that's a while ago now. It's probably different for everyone, but usually somewhere around like, you know, after two years, maybe, maybe three years or so, depending on how right. bad it is, depends on how many years benefit I'll give them. <laughs> like, <laughs> I would say for me, it's maybe about three years. That's okay. the yeah. number that popped into my head. Well, yeah, um, that's fair. On a just a purely materials perspective as well, like we again we're mentioning mega scans. I think one of the things that Ben does very well is um, I remember and actually it's a funny little story. There's a piece of my portfolio where like I had a bit of marvelous design that, and I was I asked Ben directly, should I delete this? Because it's technically cheating. It isn't. It isn't 100% designer. And he laughed at me, like said, "Dude, it does not matter." And this one is a great example because I believe from what I'm saying, there's some mega scans blended into this, and I think this is something quite important for long materials. I just know is you know it's. 100% designer is completely arbitrary and does not really matter. Um, good results are what matter. And if that means you use Megascans or ZBrush or simulations for modeling packages, it I think uh, just for, the, for those expiring to be materials artists out there, it's a very important point to to drill on because I've, we we are weird as artists. We do get into weird like kind of trends, I guess. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, is Everything has to be 100% 100% designer at one point. Uh, the mega scans trends for the scenes for that. Um, RTX when when Unreal Five came out and everyone wanted to do their looming scenes, and it's like I think part of it is remember what you're doing your art for. Um, it will help you know make make your portfolio stand the test of time as well. I think. Yeah, man, I'm getting lost and I'm not talking because I'm looking at Ben's stuff. <laughs> Like it's so, so crazy. Good. I just don't understand. Like some of it is just real. Yeah, I swear it really real. is. It's uh, and it, you know what? It's funny actually. So one thing. So this is actually this applies to all art out there. Like um, I think doing pieces of art 
that aren't regularly done. Um, an example of this, the easy example is don't make, if you're a weapons artist, maybe don't make an AK. Everybody makes AKs. Um, mm. And I think a lot of, a lot of this stuff, I, I love these examples particularly because they're really complicated shapes. And it's the kind of thing, I think this was the one which uh, like gave Ben a lot of trouble. And it's kind of from a uh, you know, purely visual point of view, you might think, oh, that's kind of simple, right? Like it's just a, it's just a material, but showing these really odd um assets and this applies to you know weapons concept characters showing unique stuff is interesting to look at is a huge benefit because for us looking at art if you've seen one brick wall you've seen them all mm. and you know i mean for me particularly like i always look back to chris hodgson's uh brick wall is my favorite one of my favorite materials it's nearly going on five years old at this point but every time I see a brick wall, I'm like, eh, it's good, but it's not as good as Chris's. And I think yeah. that's one of the things that's really oh, that's interesting. In, interesting that Ben's done is these are all super unique and interesting materials to show his technical control over the software. And this applies to everything. Like, no matter what the discipline is, this rule can be applied, and I think it's probably quite a useful one. That's a, that's a good point, right? Because maybe even subconsciously, if, even if we don't do it on purpose, we probably tend to compare things. And yes. so if you've made something that's never been made before, you can't compare it to anything. So it's already yeah. going to be the best of that thing you've ever seen. Like, wow, this is the best I've ever seen because it's the only one. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so it's, yeah, it's good to be unique and it, it helps you kind of stand out not only with that uniqueness, but then you have less people you're competing against when you create yeah. something like that. You tend to animate these as well, which are quite interesting. Yes. Mm. It's uh I mean, they're all just, yeah, this is, in terms of like an example material portfolio, this is the one for me personally, from an artistic point of view as well. Uh, like just none of them look like materials. I, you know, materials can look like materials, but they look gamey. None of these can be that vibe, which I, I love. Um, but so this next example, um, it's Josh Carter. We're talking about hard surface now. Which is a, an interesting one because there's, I think this is where you start to, I mean, we were talking about this um, previously, but you're like, you're showing your technical you know, ability to model, which is the sort of entry point to this role. But you have to be kind of a visual designer at the same time. Like, you, it's not like your job is just to come in and model the thing. A lot of the time, as hard surface specialists, um, you're having to design as well, right? Yeah, function yeah. and design for sure. So much more thought goes into it than maybe you'd initially realize. Like, you know, you, you want to build a, a robot hand, but then as an example, you have this one open here. Like, there's actual anatomy in this robot hand. Like, it's not just hard surface modeling. He had to go through and understand, you know, where the tendons are, like pulling the fingers and how, like, the thumb is going to rotate and people grab things. And you need to try to find a way to incorporate that all into your designs. And, that becomes really difficult with hard service. So uh, it's it's not just like uh, sci-fi hallways and, and bevels when you want to do hard surface art. Like getting into the the high class of hard surface involves like a really in-depth look at so many different things. Dude, the, the tips of those fingers is crazy to me. It's like, yeah. Because I look at it and I'm like, okay, those look like, those must wire into something that helps like whatever this robot is like feel. It's like yeah. sensory sensory nodes, and then uh, Alex, you were talking about the little tendons on the underside of the hand the other day. Yeah, and they are just—they actually look like they function. Yeah, well, the way a tendon functions in your hand, like yeah, they're they're, they're the full, simulating like the exact same, so exact same function. And I think it's funny you mentioned sci-fi hallways, which like as environment artists, like whenever <laughs> someone asks me what should I avoid, I say sci-fi hallways, and I say that because to do a good sci-fi hallway like this is really, really, really hard. Like there's oh, so much functional design and aesthetic design going into this. It isn't just about your ability to model some nice bevels and some nice like booleans. It's the visual language that goes into it, the balance of like noise and um, eye rest of form versus function. It's a really hard thing to do. It's, it's why everything. I always say avoid it. <laughs> yeah, sci-fi tends to be uh, really clean, but then 
also like there's certain areas where it becomes really high density it's a really mm -hmm. good way to like if you squint your eyes at the scene you can see that uh, the 30 70 ratio where 30 percent that high detail and 70 percent areas of rest yeah and it's you can just see it so clearly with the way this like are there even any materials in here as far as albedo goes it almost it looks <laughs> it doesn't look like it it's all it I almost looks a, like I it's all bit, rough it might be things rough bad bit. Yeah, uh, yeah. The, I mean, there there is roughness, but I think all the color is just coming from from lighting. Um, it might be, yeah. Uh, besides, maybe the main figure in the center there. I think you're right. I'm just realizing this is Moya 3D and Blender. That's cool. Huh. Man, the yeah. iterations. Oh, that's so sick. <laughs> yeah, and, and then this, the famous prop. Coming back to like the thoughtful design again with this hard service, like. Uh, it's it, it's always cool to have you know piping or uh, cables and things like that but this this has even this idea of the exposed cables and uh like the the hanging bars and stuff similar to mm -hmm. if you've ever looked up when you're at um, an airport or in the office building and you see they have all these things organized enough that they're out of the way but then open enough that they're easy access for people to do maintenance on them and if you need to check the wiring and the cables and make sure everything's running properly, like that's all part of this design that's that's real world. Like he's taking real world examples and incorporating it into this sci-fi sci-fi hallway. That's pretty bomb. And it comes back to again this whole thing with um if you're interested in that, if you're interested in visual design and all of these kinds of things, these are the you know, hard sur being a hard surface artist, there are plenty of roles out there for this kind of thing. And if you are interested in this, it's like you start taking them initial steps, design a prop, design you know, functional things uh, with like you know, hard surface in mind, you can definitely go this route. And like it, it's funny actually, I speak to a couple of people who are like in the hard surface community. Hard surface designers are in super high demand because finding somebody who is both competent at the like the production side of it, you know, actually modeling um, this well and designing, actually designing the stuff is really hard to come by. Like normally, you know, that'd be a two person job. You'd have a concept artist and a, and a, a model art to do it. When you find the uh, hard surface designers who really do have both of them it's uh it's really impressive and actually this one i just want to touch on um which we didn't mention in the beginning um, i get asked this quite a lot where if so someone says if i focus on you know say for example um this prop i focus on this as my first portfolio piece uh, a prop which that is this small do i rule out other jobs absolutely not you know the the skills that you do in all of these different you know, specialities are for the most part transferable like if you can model this then i assume you can model other props um and just like if we look um uh, just to backtrack a little bit if we go to like martin's piece it's like i know this guy can make props like some a lot of his props are hit most of his props are still his um just because you focus in this direction does not mean you're ruling out other options and that's what a lot of people tend to get scared of when they focus in their portfolios to be a bit more deliberate they're worried they limiting their options and you're absolutely not you know competent artists are competent artists you're just giving yourself a bit of direction so that you can be more efficient and actually you know progress in a particular domain but i just wanted to mention that because that's something that always comes up whenever i talk about this it's like oh i might be you know no one will hire me if i'm just this or if i'm just that mm -hmm. um yeah you're just want, showing your technical skill set right yeah it's like a portfolio is really showing like your your tastes your your choices for what you do with the skills that you have mm -hmm. and as you progress in your skill the the detail or the quality of the content just goes up but the what it looks like and the things that you're actually building that's your interest that's the so everything you see on your portfolio um that should be what like we keep saying it as well in the stream it's like that should be the thing that you want to be doing that's the yeah. the look and feel that you want Someone's uh, someone's asking, which kind of relates to like this portfolio. Even is uh, any recommendations for transitioning from offline render to Unreal or or real time? Um, because like yeah, so this here is like a all offline render portfolio. It looks like uh, I don't think any of it's going to be in real time. And so um, coming into this real time field from offline is probably a bit more 
challenging with lighting setups and optimizations and thinking about things like that. Uh, but at least coming from this strong background of knowing the design and the skills and uh, how to create good lighting in an offline setup or how to create the proper colors and composition, you can still transfer all of those skills mm -hmm. into a, a real time or unreal engine environment. Um, in terms of actually just getting started on it though, but you probably just want to start checking out some of the R station learning or uh, YouTube tutorials or finding a lot of unreal lighting setups because lighting is probably going to be one of the biggest things like we were talking about uh, the other day in terms of yeah, optimization for your scene so lighting lighting uh, can easily just increase the frame count and the uh, yeah the, the fps is going to go way down if you have like 20 lights they're all real time they're all shadows like it, your scene's just going to be dead so considering your, your lighting when switching from offline to real time is, is something big yeah the uh, the other thing i want to emphasize i guess it's it's more in like creating of content for for uh, real time uh, mm -hmm. versus offline rendering it's like when when someone's learning 3d for games i i strongly suggest not thinking about low poly and not worrying about like mm -hmm. how do i unwrap this and how do i texture and like just get really good at replicating something in in 3d like even if it's sub D and just modeling stuff and just getting used to moving geometry around. And then from there, you can start to dig into like how how unwraps work, how how you bake maps over and how you lower the resolution of content to be able to run real time. And then all of the, the little tricks and stuff come naturally as you kind of progress down that road. I wouldn't even say you'd start texturing stuff until you can be comfortable baking something and transitioning something from a high poly to a low poly if you're looking from like that uh offline rendering viewport and then going to to real-time content that's totally a, a good point that i didn't realize actually because i started 3d in high school but when i look back on it i don't think i actually textured my first asset until like my second or third year of college at that point so i yeah. was just modeling uh, and rendering the whole time and maybe putting like a simple you know, swirl on the side of a car or something, but not actually texturing and going into the grid of it. So that's a great point. Um, yeah, if you're if you're going to start with modeling. Yeah. Yeah, that's solid to not really think about all the technicalities first. That'll help a lot. Just to get the understanding of it. Speaking of technicality, so lighting is uh, like you've you've briefly touched on it that like you know in in industry you know a large portion of lighting is um the optimization side of it like every time i've worked with lighting artists you have got like the creative side of it, which is like almost expected just like it's expected from a model to be able to model um but a lot of it is the technical side of it so when it comes to portfolio um it can be quite difficult to do that i mean it's unless you're the brian lalu type who loves diving into creating his own tone mappers and all of this that sort of stuff but i think peter is a great example of what you can do with lighting portfolios and probably one of my favorite projects ever on art station is this where he's taken one scene and relit it multiple times and each one conveys a wildly different mood and it's showing an understanding of so many different things you know you've got the uh, composition color palette color theory but i mean for me this is like absolutely peak lighting art i love it it's beautiful i'm just the craziest gif ever yeah was... that dude that gif is sick go ahead <laughs> uh jacob oh yeah i was just gonna say i was kind of mentioning this the other day when we were talking that like i feel like lighting artists are almost kind of the the concept artists of mm -hmm. the, the 3D world because so much of concept art is composition and lighting and color theory that comes into it. And so much of lighting is is just all about the, the color theory and the composition for what you're trying to show off in a scene. Like it can completely change the space if you want to highlight a specific area, if you're making it daytime or nighttime, um, if it's going to be like uh, raining or kind of like really foggy or if it's like a red more evil color or if it's like a blue kind of light like cold color so much of this is almost just that concept that concepting of environments and um, yeah lighting art can just be beautiful when when it's done right just like these 
I think um, one thing is also interesting from a, a lighting art perspective is understanding like when lighting is going to be really important and the subject that you're lighting. So obviously this is all very much environment art heavy for lighting. I remember when um, Peter was doing this scene, lighting a character is wildly different to lighting an environment. And this is almost like, I guess you could draw this comparison to um, modeling a really hard surface like mech thing to modeling like um, something like a, a rock or something or a sculpt in a rock. It's like they're both objects and they both need to be modeled and you know unwrapped and textured. But the subject matter dictates really heavily where your attention goes and how you'd approach it. And I think it's interesting when he's tackling a character we mentioned it was it was quite difficult at the time because it's just so different and there's so much stuff to consider apart from just making the environment look good you have to highlight certain elements of the character especially in the game space as well like when it comes to games your the lighting or the lighting artist might be the one who calls out key elements of you know how to fight a boss uh, danger zones leading the player um it's not just about making a pretty picture and I'm looking at the light breakdown right now. <laughs> uh, just how it how he flips through all the layers to just show you how all the focus yeah. is shifting. And this is the first time I'm noticing the birds again. So Peter, yeah, Peter the birds, birds and the cat. Yeah, yeah. He's like scale. I, let's go. I love the fact there's a cat in every scene. I love little quirks yeah. like that. So, um, one, I think the we've spoke a lot about ways to display art. Um, for portfolios it's we've spoken about how you know being deliberate in the thematics to your portfolio one thing that i think come up quite a lot and i never really had good answers to was tech art tech art is still a fundamental part of um the game art pipeline it, for, it ends up falling a lot in into the environment art palette too because we have shape so much of the stuff that tech art create are for environment artists to use like shaders and tools and I think this is a great, I think Simon's portfolio is a great example of, if you're interested in tech art and that is the route you want to go down, then look no further than here. This is the sort of stuff you should be doing. You should be creating tools, showing how your tools are robust and you can do lots of cool things with them. This is like, if I'm ever, if someone ever says to me, oh, I want to be a tech artist, but I don't know how to curate a portfolio for it. I point here. This is, this is the perfect example in my eyes. Yeah, this is actually, so... I, I've gotten a lot of questions about that in the past as well of like, how do you make a portfolio that's a like tech artist? And this, I mean, I, I'll i be honest, dude, when, when you showed me this and we were kind of assessing our the portfolios that we wanted to show, this is uh, this is the first time I actually saw this. And uh, oh, really? now it's like, yeah, this is the, I will show this to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is some this is some magic, honestly. Like you see some of this, and it's like this video. I mean, does it just this? But it's, it's the kind of stuff where like you're showing that I can make tools that will make everyone else's life difficult uh, better. Sorry. Um, I mean, if, when you're working in environment art or when you interact with tech artists, mm. the conversation tends to go, "How can I make your life easier? How can mm. I make some? What, what's repetitive and annoying for you?" tell me and I'll make something that makes it a little bit easier. That's, and when you can showcase that you can do that in your portfolio with something like this, it's like, okay, like this person's clearly a very proficient <laughs> tech artist. And it's all sorts of different, I mean, this is Houdini, Simon's a Houdini wizard, but this applies to, um, you know, complex shaders. Kurt Koopser did, did, has done some fantastic shader work in Unreal Engine and blueprints and scripts and tools like that. Um, Blender tools, I've, I've seen a couple of guys who have, because of Blender being open source, they've made lots of free add-ons and plugins for that. Um, you can showcase your tech art skills, but this gives, I think this this is a good example of how you can showcase it in a way that's still visually interesting, right? Because yeah. I think that's the worry, right? Is that, oh, I made a cool tool, um, but it's, it doesn't look very good on a, on a portfolio. And I think this is a good way to show, oh, you can take it a little bit step further and show how powerful it is. And that's a lot more interesting to look at for us as you know, visual people. Yeah, it, it can be really difficult to find uh, someone who's a, a good balance of that technical understanding while still being able to create the, the quality artwork to show off that technical understanding as well. And so, yeah, the, the, more, the more skills that you have that you're proficient at, um, then the less likely you're, you're ever going to be out of a job. 
um, because there's always going to be an opportunity for you. And especially tech art, I feel is kind of underrated, like, or it's just not talked about enough, but at every, at every good studio, um, so many, yeah, yeah, they're absolutely heroes. Like they, they save the day for us all the time. Like, um, there was a couple instances at, at Naughty Dog where maybe I came up on a close deadline uh, and then only because of some of the tools that people had, had built, uh, I was able to quickly knock it out and get it done in time um, and get the vision that you want at a, at a faster speed. And that's that's what like yeah, tech art's trying to accomplish is just help help you make the artwork you want to make faster. Yeah, for sure. So we've been so i want to stop sharing now um so we've sort of gone through a bunch of different portfolios and again to reiterate the point it's if you have a direction that you want to go in if say and it's like i said we've been using environment art as spaces but in all the different disciplines i think the point we're trying to get on is be very de- being very deliberate with your portfolio and taking a direction and work, moving in that direction and your the work you create is pushing you in that that general um to them general studios i think is far better than like i said at the beginning i showed my portfolio uh, from like four years ago or five years ago now god 2017 is five years ago um and it's like it's not it, it it's directionless it's i'm not really being good at anything in particular someone i mean one thing someone said to me a long time ago and it's like it's i still say today is your portfolio is there to answer questions and when someone comes to your portfolio if they can walk away and they know everything they need to know without having to follow up and ask you questions your portfolio is doing its job but if i'm looking at your portfolio and i have to go okay like this person can do x y and z but i'm not sure if they can do a and b I need to now follow, you know, you've added that extra barrier of entry, which they now need to figure out. And that's when yeah, that's our art tests come in. That's usually, yeah, that's usually when an art test shows up. Cause like when you look at a portfolio, like I already have the question, I'm looking for this, this specific artist that's in my head for what mm-hmm, I'm working mm-hmm. on. And then when you see a portfolio, if like Alex is saying, it answers the question, then you're like, cool, let's contact this person. But when it, when it doesn't and you're like, okay, where is it? Where is it kind of weak on the things that I'm looking for? That's like you're saying, Alex. It's uh, you look at a the art test will answer those questions for you, and I feel like um, art tests are uh, they can scare people, but it's mm-hmm. it's usually it's usually to check on something that they're kind of a little iffy about, and just doing the test and just committing to uh, working on the test based off of like your skill set you'll you'll probably answer the question for him and then it's it's off to the interviews um maybe since we're we're coming up towards like the the end of the planned time for the stream what if we take some q and a up front right now so we'll take some like questions from sure. people and then yeah. uh, after after that if you guys want to stick around we have a, a couple things for fun that we'd like to show uh, as well. If you want to stick around for a surprise, but yeah, if if you guys got some some Q and A, we can answer that. And then uh, for the survivors at the end of the stream, they they get a little treat. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I'll jump into that one. Um, Paul's yeah, asked up front. Um, do you think it's a good idea to include breakdowns and making of content in your portfolio posts, or would you keep them separate? Um, I think there's two like there's two different types of breakdowns I like to see. So there's obviously the uh, sort of whips and kind of the tools being created and working. I like to see them in the same post as like the whole environment. I like to sort of see a whole environment, and if I see a whip at the bottom that shows me how it got to where it was, I really like that. Um, what I would say is if you've got like a bunch of props you want to show off as well, I prefer to see them in a separate post to the portfolio. As a rule of thumb, if I if there's more than like I guess twelve ish images, I have to scroll through. I might start getting bored by the time I'm getting down to 12 or thinking, okay, I've kind of seen everything. Yeah. So if you put a bunch of really nice environment shots and then all your props are buried at the bottom, I may never get to the bottom because I just think it's more environment art shots. So your props, I would separate out or like props, materials, whatever. I'd separate that that out. But on your actual environment post or your big post, whips and like the tools that's gone into making that thing come together, I think is a really good idea. Yeah, seeing seeing the uh, the props at the end of the post is usually where you would expect to see it as well. But um, 
sometimes you get like a props gym where it's just like a bunch of the all the assets mm -hmm. that you've used are in one <laughs> image and i think when it's in that case where you have a few breakouts like that's totally fine to have in the one post but i think like alex is saying if it turns into a huge like it can stand up on its own as a, as a single post that's when you can definitely have it as a separate separate piece and you can kind of you can keep them next to each other you can brand the thumbnails so that they visually connect i think we were talking about mm -hmm. this yesterday as well mm -hmm. but uh yeah you can brand them so that they look like they fit together uh, and they can follow each other around as well yeah it's definitely nice to have uh, some kind of breakdown in there because it's it's good to know then if you are using things like mega scans or if it's a team environment like what things you worked on uh, what things others worked on and, and it just helps to kind of uh, make it more clear for the people looking at it and then just splitting it up like the way that alex and jeremy were mentioning is good um so I, there is an interesting question i want to hear your two's thoughts because i have my thoughts on it but i'm really curious what you two think yeah. how do you feel about um how important is it to show practical skills like lods good uvs and topology that that are in our day-to-day -day, um you know the boring the quote-unquote boring stuff how important is that to have that on your portfolio <laughs> the, the boring stuff really you, okay, Alex clearly thinks it's. <laughs> no, no, that's um, in the question. That's in the question. I don't think it's boring. It's in the question. It's okay. You don't have to defend yourself. Yeah. Alex. <laughs> no, it's. I mean, so talking uh, pretty closely with uh, like prop leads uh, over over the course of me being in the industry, it's like it's become very clear to me that uh, the perspective of an environment or a, or a level artist and the perspective of a of props team like their their views and and level artist views are very different when it comes to what what they're looking for detail wise so i think when it comes to if you want to be a props artist the showing that you can manually laud when needed is is nice and showing how you uv in a smart way to keep texel density high or to use the the pixels that you have on this on an asset in a way where you're reusing a lot of it it's like overlapping uvs and stuff it's i would say prop art's more technical than uh than level art in that sense because level art you're you're building scenes with existing content blocking out stuff and and then bringing it over to a props team to build in, at least in a triple a AAA scene mm -hmm. so it if the studio gets smaller the team is smaller uh i think jacob was talking on it earlier you, you have to wear uh, multiple hats at that point but uh, I don't know what do you what do you think Jacob yeah yeah like especially um, you know things like like rocks or, or sculpting you're most likely just going to have that decimated down and you don't necessarily need the nice edge flow on it compared to uh, specific props where yeah if that edge flow is going to be broken too much then you try to make it a high poly and smooth it out you're going to get some really janky nasty looking stuff from it um it's it's going to be interesting to see how this is going to evolve in the future with things like nanite how much topology is going to be important as we're advancing like for now it's it's not going to be industry standard i'd say for at least a few more years but we're going to see it start jumping out a lot more in in some of the content and so it's still important i would say to be able to focus on topology at least for things like um if you're doing environments where you're going to have vertex painting and you're building things out you need to have a, a a way to get those edge like the vertexes and the edge lines uh spread evenly enough that when you're vertex painting you're not going to get these long like triangle shaped mm -hmm. kind of blends that that make it look really strange and odd so it can be useful and important in those situations um but I, I can't but, say oh, one man. way or the other. Like I always look for it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I can't say I always look for a good topology or I don't look for good topology. If they show it, I'll check it out. But um, yeah, I guess I guess I don't I don't tend to focus on it as much. I think that's the, the issue is you, if you show it, you you want to be very certain that it's actually worth showing, and you're yes. not going to make people then so i've seen people show very bad topology and i've gone oh okay that's ruined your piece almost i'm like okay i'm now questioning this and i've seen people show amazing topology that's made me go oh you achieve this piece with that little tries like amazing so i think it's you want to be very conscious of is this worth showing off i've seen the same just to move us to environment a little bit lighting complexity i've seen people post like their lighting complexity passes 
and they're all like white and red and i'm like this isn't a pro like you this isn't <laughs> yeah. a good thing but then there's like i've seen good sides of it where um i believe uh jason or did it on the slaughterhouse scene he shows his line complexity and it's like he looks like he has a very cinematic lighting setup and it's oh it's nearly all green like damn he's achieved this it's, look yeah it's quite optimistic. and not yeah and it's like so show it if you have something to show mm. but it's kind of be aware if you're going to show it you may be also raising further questions which you may not want to have to answer <laughs> uh, how do you guys uh manage deadlines that was one of the questions we had in here um yeah i mean it, it can often come down to just having to to scope things like so many times you'll you'll want to try to pack in as much as you can but if you have a set deadline First of all, I think that's important because otherwise you can continue on something forever and ever if you're doing personal work and maybe just come up with more ideas and it keeps on trailing. And in some ways that that can be good. You can come up with some, some cool things, but you can also let it go on for too long. So I, th I personally like to set some kind of deadline for myself and say, get it done by this point so that um, I sometimes have to come up with like interesting solutions to get it done by then. And it also helps you stay on track and stay on schedule. Um, but then if you're in a studio environment and may, maybe uh, there's just too much work to be done within a certain timeline, then hopefully your your lead was able to work with designers or work with people to try to help scope the amount of work that needs to be done um, while still keeping things interesting or else like bringing more people on to the team in a way that you can do it to, to help get that done in time. Um, yeah, deadlines deadlines can be tricky as you can see in the games industry and there's there's a lot of talk about the right way to do it and I think we're all still kind of figuring that out. It, it might be oh it's Alex I was going to say no, uh, go ahead. It it might be worth uh when you're working on an asset that let's say you're going to model something that you're quite comfortable with. Um just time the phases of it and just kind of see how long it actually takes. If you're if you're focusing on going from start to finish on creating an asset, it doesn't have to be in one sitting either, right? But it's like, how long does it take you to gather your reference? How long does it take you to build your high poly if there's going to be a bake? How about the low poly and the UVs and getting the bake out? Texturing phase, how long do all those take? And then you start to see that now you have a metric that you can work off of and then you can scale from there. You're like, okay, this scene's going to have like 15 props in it. The complexity of these, I'm assuming it's going to take this long per per prop and you can start to add up like how long it's going to take you to, to do the project that you're you're setting out for and then scoping like uh jacob saying you can scale you can you can de-scope based off of that like one of the best ways to cut down on the amount of time it's going to take a scene take to make a scene is to just set one camera angle and yeah. prop to that and not look anywhere else and you're golden I mean, I think that's a rule you should just do with your port. In general, when I see yeah. environment art portfolios, I'm nearly, it's very rare where I've seen someone who I can walk around the entire scene and I'm like, that's amazing, versus someone who's made one shot. I think um, I'm really pragmatic with port, like projects anyway. Like, I think the way I view it is I've worked out what like I actually want to get out of a project. Because like, someone, an AD said to me, like my first studio, it was uh, like, your art's never going to be finished. There's always, you could do this. You could do this. You could do this. I could, I could try this technique. I could push this a little bit further. I think knowing what the sort of criteria for success is on whatever it is you're doing, it could really make it easy to know when to draw a line in the sand and call it done. And by getting them habits of knowing, and that, that sounds, it could sound kind of bad. And there is a, there is a bad side to it where, you know, you don't push it as far as you could. But that's where you have your peers or your bosses to help you know push you further along. But I mean, getting in the habit of knowing what we should and shouldn't be doing, or like what is enough to achieve what we're trying to achieve out of this, and be understanding what that is, is quite important. Because I know my mindset shifted from because that timing that I did. I remember Jeremy, you said that a while ago, and I did it. And the, the issue I had was I spent nearly no time ref gathering or planning. I just dived straight in. And every time I end up, I either didn't finish the project or I'll come back and have to like redo it. Whereas now, I think the bulk of my time goes into the planning and ref gathering stage because then you can go in autopilot and you just run through the rest of it. But I, I definitely see my time going more and more into the planning stage now versus the you know the the actual production stage. 
Uh, another another good question I'm seeing here is like production work versus personal work, and which do you prefer, and why? Um, so, at least personally, like I think it's good to show some personal work in your portfolio. It doesn't have to be all personal work, or it doesn't have to be a, a big pile of it. But it's just nice, at least for me, to see that outside of your work, you're you're still interested in exploring new things and trying new things that you want to learn because a lot of times in production uh, you know you do have tight deadlines and and you are like under under fire to to try to get things done in a certain amount of time maybe you can't spend as much time to polish what you're working on or maybe you haven't had that opportunity to try something new that you wanted to get into or like a, a new program or something so it's nice to see that exploration i feel that people get more often with personal work and that's really interesting to know what they're interested in as an artist as well which is kind of what we've been talking about with the portfolio aspect you can show more what you want to do with your personal work and you don't always get that opportunity in the production environment but on right. that sense uh, i'll just yeah. say really quickly too that like if it's amazingly high quality production work then yeah that's fine like uh, it, that's great i'll still take it you can always rearrange it too right you can move things around. Yeah. Uh, I I like to see what what an artist likes to put up front. Like, I just, mm -hmm. if they're putting their personal stuff up front, like, more power to the to the stuff they're able to do in their free time. And if they're really proud of the, the projects they're working on, they'll put those up front. And it's it's about, I guess, in the end, when it's, when it's projects or personal art, it's about celebrating the fact that this, whoever the artist is was able to you know finish a scene because you know our we have a everyone's got a closet <laughs> of uh scenes that are not done and will never yeah. be looked at again i think it's a perspective it... from you guys though like with all this being said for me personally when i look at production work mm -hmm. it, and i, I don't know this is because we're in industry but i kind of go i know nearly every single piece of my production work is what at least 10 people has gone into this. It's mm -hmm. not, I, you know, there's a little bit of a detachment from my perspective. So when I look at the people's, the detachment I feel to my own production work, I kind of mirror onto that. So when I look at someone's production work, just for argument's sake, um, your stuff, Jacob, your uh, like Naughty Dog stuff, for example, I look at it, I go, okay, cool. Is this, this is like Naughty Dog with Jacob to you know, stay with the ship. Uh, I am far more interested, or at least I'm far more impressed by when I see that versus one of your personal scenes, and I'm like, this is all Jacob, like this is all him. Yeah. Um, and that's just and that is born purely from my own detachment from my own production work. But that's I, I, I it's curious. You, how do you guys feel about that when you're looking at other people's production work? Yeah, no, I I definitely agree with that, and um, it's funny. I was I was starting to to think about that as you mentioned it that you do look at people's production work and often think oh how much of that is theirs like um yeah uh yeah even even like you're talking about my work but when i was going through uh, uh your portfolio like do do we want to kind of check out each other's portfolio real quick here and see maybe something... yeah sure yeah okay let me uh <laughs> Uh, lots of questions along the way <laughs> yeah here i'm sharing my screen uh wait no let me share my screen here real quick um okay is that popping up already uh yeah there we go oh, okay yeah yeah so um like you were mentioning like uh it's difficult to know sometimes when looking at it like uh, you have your godfall stuff uh right up front which is it's beautiful work and when when i was looking at it i i also was thinking to myself uh like how much of that was all alex versus how much of that uh was like a team aspect too because i know there must be like lighters and effects artists or uh, concept and 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 so much that goes into even mm -hmm. a scene that's already been built by uh, a 3d environment artist um and you're, you're free to comment on that if you want. Uh, otherwise, I'll kind of just take a look at this and say that if I were to kind of guess what you were going for with your portfolio, if I didn't scroll down, I don't I don't know right off the bat. But to, initially, it looks like you got really into materials. Uh, you're really enjoying like substance designer and 
just trying to advance your skill set with that. And after a, a certain point, then I, if if this is all in order of timeline, I, I'm not sure I haven't clicked on it all. No. But at least in the presentation, it looks like you started to explore new things like ZBrush sculpts and checking out um, like placement of environments or doing like lighting uh, lighting scenarios and even more abstract stuff. So it, you did a great job then of just presenting this in a way that looks like you're evolving from materials through all these different fields and exploring new ideas um, within it. So yeah, it's pretty, uh, yeah, I'm none of these are, uh, yeah, this isn't an order. I, it's like I said earlier, like I, I do structure my portfolio in a way where, uh, I mean, I know I had for a long time, it was dominated by materials. I think I spent the whole of 2018 just dedicated to just trying to get better materials because I was so bad at texturing and materials. Mm. It was that uh, and, dude, crazy. Yeah, dude, it's, it's after your portfolio review, funny enough. Um, <laughs> and I spent the whole of 2018 on it. And a lot of people then thought I was just a materials guy. And like, don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with being a materials artist. But for me, I'm an environment artist first. So then I was like, I'm going to start putting my environments at the top so that when people come to my portfolio, it's like, this guy is an environment artist. Oh, he's also really good at materials. And that's how I want people to, so that's why I structured it the way I did. Mm -hmm. But it's funny, just about the Godfall stuff. It's, yeah, I'm actually, I mean, I'm, I've been quite happy for the longest time. My portfolio has been nothing but personal work. So I'm, t I'm tempted to put this stuff down in a folder because yeah, like this stuff, I'm, you know, um, I was, you've got, uh, you know, block out, Archie, beta pass, alpha pass, polish, and that gets passed around between multiple artists. And it's like, like I said, you get that detachment from it. Uh, so I'm, I'm tempted to put that down in, in, down in the bomb or in a folder just because that's not, no, no one's production work is like, all of them on screen um so I, I'm, I'm actually gonna probably put that down uh, hidden <laughs> away somewhere at some point yeah it's it's definitely interesting that just because like the way it's structured though i kind of start to form an impression and that's how you can definitely see how laying it out and the things you put in there are gonna immediately change the way that a potential recruiter or a lead at another studio would look at the portfolio as well um yeah, I don't know. Uh, we could we could go through each other's portfolio if if somebody else wants to. Uh, uh, yeah, let me um let me share this. Let me see here. Make sure I share the right. All right, I think I am sharing. Let's see here. Yeah, cool. Okay, I'm gonna just scroll all the way down here because I find this, I find this super interesting. I was looking at your portfolio last night going, okay, what, what can I say about, uh, <laughs> what can I say about Jacob? And I, I actually find it super interesting that you go down here and when you mouse over it, you realize immediately like, oh, those are, these are actually, there's like projects in here, like actual mm -hmm. shipped, shipped content, but there's no branding on it. Mm -hmm. How, so that's seven years ago, dude, resistance three. <laughs> seven years ago. <laughs> oh, Good geez. stuff, man. It's good stuff. It's been a minute. It's been a minute. <laughs> so when did that oh come in? Like, gosh. Jacob, like, because I, I know we've spoken about this before. Like, I found mm. I had no idea just how much of this was Naughty Dog work because it, you know, branded. Like, during your time on our session, I guess that trend sort of wasn't there and then came in, right? Yeah, yeah. A lot of the portfolio I had I had here, um, like, when I first started posting stuff, ArtStation was still fairly new. I started posting like mm. in 2015. I, I can't remember if ArtStation was like 2013 or 14 or so. Um, but when I started posting a lot of it, like this, this wasn't really a thing yet to do this branding. Everyone had their websites and you'd have like albums with like names underneath it and you just mm. title it. And so I just stuck with that same thing. I would just title my, my like uh, album of images for resistance and just all right if they want to see what it is you can hover over and see it's resistance three and you click on it and go in but not until people started doing these art drops and these art dumps yep. and like full teams would share all the work from a specific game it became this this branding thing um and that that kind of caught on pretty well and at that point i started posting up like nvidia at the bottom you can see even the very first time i branded it it's a different nvidia logo than the other ones where I start to actually put the project name next to NVIDIA. And so even that 
evolved in my own portfolio over time. Um, and I just never went back to update all the other ones because did you I have you changed the order of these at all? I, I do have, yeah, like the ones I kind of like the most, I put more towards the top, and the ones I like less, I put more towards the bottom. Um, you know, just it's funny enough, actually, just on and you know, we said earlier, I like obviously your older stuff or stuff which is like less quality, you don't put in the portfolio. It's funny, we have a different rule though for our production work because, like, if you look through any of your resistors stuff, like you, yeah. uh, I imagine if you're doing if you were just to make something like that just off the bat without game optimization, you're you know far more capable because of games having their limitations and the you know the console uh, limitations. But we still keep them on, right? And we're like, it's got we view it through a completely different lens because I guess everyone knows that oh, well, I'm operating under the, the console restriction, so it doesn't matter, but we still have it on there. We have yeah. to view it in a different light, don't we? yeah yeah absolutely it's like we were talking about you kind of give people the benefit of the doubt depending mm -hmm. on how long ago it was uh, and a lot of that comes from the technology like nowadays not only do we have much better engines to to render everything in but i feel like the tools to even create the artwork has grown so much that the bar is just upped that much more even just getting started um so so I, i'm okay still leaving up my old stuff because not only do, do I think like, oh man, it was so cool to be able to work on some of these projects. I want to show that. Yeah. Um, but then also, yeah, I, I expect that when people see it and they know it's a long time ago, that they'll kind of take that into consideration, knowing it might not be mm -hmm. as good as it would be now. Just your attention to detail, it just keeps going up. It's like you're starting to really focus on like the close-ups. Like, okay, I got to, like, I just want to get this little, you know, and then here yeah. it's super clear like okay i know what you like <laughs> so on this piece on this piece the, one of the guys uh we were chatting and they shared so that tray that edge that long edge mm -hmm. isn't straight is it jacob you purposely bent it a little bit because you're like oh in the ref like this this edge isn't perfectly straight it's a that attention to detail is like even i when the guy showed me i was like you oh, must be kidding me you noticed it that's amazing yeah. Well, I didn't know. I didn't. So the person in his new Harare who uh, uh, noticed it and he pointed it out to all of us, and we're all like, "Oh, you've got to be kidding me!" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that's those imperfections, like I was talking about earlier with prop work, like those small details. We don't even think about it like consciously in our mind, but when we see it, all those imperfections and like the the squeezing edges or the the bulging edges when when something's like in the sun it starts to like expand a bit more the paint's gonna bubble uh or like yeah you're bumping things and moving it around like the model itself needs to be slightly imperfect to show too. That. yeah um, cool well uh, let's let's take a look at jeremy La last one oh let's, have a, let's have a peek <laughs> at jeremy's <laughs> because actually funny enough uh it so your portfolio says a lot more about you than I think you realize. Like, I know we were speaking about this, and I think your portfolio shows a different side. Like, it's not just about the art for me. Like, all of the, because you have a lot of your dynasty stuff on here, right? Like, um, the the mm. challenges you've done. And if we go through, like, your portfolio is more than just that tab as well. Like, go to your about page, not your about, sorry, your blog page, you know, all of this. And I'm like, even though I pretend I didn't know you, if I came to your portfolio, I was looking through all of this, and you, you know, you did this whole scene on stream, I'd be saying, "Oh, this person clearly has like a lot of sort of what's the word? Good soft skills, right? Like you're you're very community driven, and all of these sorts of things. And I think that says a lot about you and your portfolio. That maybe maybe someone who comes here that they're, they're looking purely at the art and looking through like all your cool division work but i think this says a lot about you as a person and it's probably why you're so suited to um suited to being like a lead i think i think you make a fantastic lead just because i know you as a person and i know how good you are with people in the community and everything that you do i think this this portfolio definitely shows our side of you and it is not many people who can say that about their portfolios i don't think oh man Inner blushing. Oh, I for a sec. <laughs> bro, hug, I bro, know. hug it out, guys. Uh, uh, <laughs> I don't even know how to. Thanks. <laughs> like, uh, I'm terrible with uh, positive uh, reinforcement. I don't know. <laughs> like, 
<laughs> it's one of those I'm just quite curious is um uh you know we've been we've been talking about portfolios right like and about what you could do to add to your portfolio and ordering it if you would like if you're looking to move or if you're not happy where you are like you know all of these sorts of things i think there's there's also something to be said that if you're really happy where you are and you're progressing fine where you are like your portfolio you don't need to do all of this stuff that we've been talking about right like you know the um ordering it so that your most interested stuff is at the top and all that kind of stuff like i think if you're somebody who's happy in your studio and you're happy with your job like you should i don't think there should be pressure to like oh i need to churn out work and like tell them a portfolio and do xyz if you're happy where you are i think that's also a very important thing to say and if you don't mind me saying um, this is me purely as someone objectively looking as if i didn't know you jeremy i would assume look at your portfolio you're somebody who's very happy where you are um and very sort of self-assured in who you are as an artist that you don't feel the need to churn out every waking moment more and more like portfolio work um some old stuff in there man <laughs> I, I think i just sort of shrinks that one the worth like, one you worked with Shrinex? Yeah, yeah. Dude. <laughs> I know. It was all oh super God, stuff. You... Yeah, yeah. That stuff was super fun, man. Dang. How did you even get that gig? Uh, another friend named Jeremiah. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah, it, um, yeah. No, but there's the, the War in the North stuff that's in here. That's 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 aging, and I will always keep it in there. I thought this was just, Gears of War when I saw the thumbnail. I'm not gonna lie. Oh. The brown and greenish tones. I thought of Gears of War. <laughs> yeah, I can see that too. Adam, Adam Phoenix's house. Yeah, that's so interesting when it comes to colors that we almost start to associate certain games with 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 colors. Uh, just because if if something has like a color theory pushed so much into it, uh, it, it oh, yeah, just shows like a, how much lighting changes it. Oh, so this was the art test. Yeah. Okay, that's cool. Uh, optimization and like the amount we could get in terms of quality has gone up. Like the quality of the sculpt versus like what oh, you're able to crazy. get through in textures. Mm. Wow, this is cool. Still my favorite. One of my favorite ones. I love this. Sh oh no, why is that on the top shot, Jeremy? Why is that <laughs> the top shot? About. This should be the top shot. Oh my god, I'm changing yeah. it right now. Hang on. I, I'd have to agree with Alex. Be the top shot. I would agree with that I as well. <laughs> I would agree. I agree. <laughs> Don't attack. Oh man, I, 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 if I was looking at this, I already closed it after that first shot. Oh <laughs> my god. <laughs> so especially so, especially after the thumbnail tells you that's what you're gonna look at. Yeah, you yeah. It, you're yeah. like, what? Dude, three years ago. That's crazy. Time, man. Time is weird. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I don't yeah. know how how much longer I can handle looking at my own portfolio. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah, so, well, yeah, we only have a uh, we're already over time that we originally discussed. But I guess if uh, if you guys wanted to, then we mentioned like we were going to share a little treat. We could show oh, okay. Uh, our, because everyone class. everyone comes from from somewhere so we were just going to show you all kind of really quickly without commenting on it too much where we started from uh so i'll share my screen here really quick and yeah we, we don't need to go into detail or talk about this a lot we'll just we'll uh, we'll, we'll just skip along uh but so this is oh. some of my first work this is like back in college work uh some guitar workshop stuff and some stools those are those are something there's not even any shadows in this scene <laughs> very nice uh amazing first first character attempt right there team fortress and everyone has um, a crack at like every environment artist <laughs> has tried a little bit of character it's a snake <laughs> <laughs> oh man i love that right. oh dude all right that'll oh, do it for me yeah. all right hang on uh, I'll be... I... You got it. You go for it. Yeah, I've got mine. Uh, let me just share and pull it up. So yeah, as I said, that was like my portfolio from like 2017. But like back before, like I used to think, and I used to get super upset that we're getting interviews like when I had like this because I was like, well, I could model, and that's what's required for the job, right? 
Uh, and I remember when Endu came out, uh, Endu and Didu, and I tried it out for the first time and I made this and I thought, I was I was like, that's it. Ubisoft could have come knocking. Uh, <laughs> um, it's, yeah, that first one I was ZBrush and I basically had the side profile of this concept on constantly. I never turned it straight on. And I turned it straight on. I'm like, oh, wait, this makes zero <laughs> sense. <laughs> Oh, that's horrible. Oh my God, that's Just really eyes to the mouth. Uh, it's all kinds and, of bad. And, and speaking to the portfolios aspect, like this is where, yeah, you're, you're all learning what you're interested in. You're trying out different things and just learning tools and understanding without this optimization aspect. Uh, and it helps you to start to get into the field and the parts of environment art or 3D art that you enjoy. So, so yeah, I mean, I see you on cool. real quick. Oh man, this is going to be. I think I'm sharing the right uh, right window. Yeah, okay. 2007, are you ready? This is all zero to one. I didn't know that you oh, could tile okay. materials yet. And this were bump maps because no one told me about normal maps yet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boom, then, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, dude, and everything is zero to one here. Like Damn, that's all the panels, all the walls, it's all in one. You got to work on some optimization for that one, though, man. <laughs> Jeremy, your laser lines. I can see it's polity. Oh, laser lines. Look at <laughs> look at this, dude. This is uh, top tier. I was like counting verts, and I was Good. looking at Gears of War, right? Oh, I, yeah, I can kind of see. Inspired, yeah, dude. Look at this ground. <laughs> oh, wow! This is uh, dude, that Unreal, Unreal Landscapes. Was that Unreal Landscapes? I think two point five. DDK. European worn cobblestone ground there. This is uh, hey, dude, that's the, not what the roads to Coventry are like. <laughs> yeah, this is the first time I used. Uh, I think it was when Gears came out. You could actually open Unreal, and I started dragging assets in. Um, oh my! Oh yeah, look at this and the characters. There it is. Everyone yeah, here to it go. is. This was so. <laughs> I, I don't know awful. if you guys remember wow. game game artisans. That's cool. Yeah. This is actually, I don't know why it's in this order. This was the first time I uh, made a ZBrush sculpt. <laughs> this is That's one plane. Time? It started as a plane. Think about oh that. Oh my gosh. It's Dude, one I, match. Do you remember that trend? Like, you know how everyone ZBrush sculpts now, myself included, do the like the metal gray uh, matte cap? Do you remember when the blue matte cap was everywhere on ZBrush sculpts? Yeah. Oh, look at that face. And I'll be honest, I think I think that's the perfect place to leave off the zap phase. Yeah. Um, there we go. <laughs> so what we, I mean for me personally I want to say is thank you to our station and everyone behind the scenes who made this possible. Like I think this is really useful for people. Thank you for the invite. It it means a bunch. Yeah. yeah this, this thank you so much for having us on yeah. and uh hopefully you are all able to pick up some cool stuff or ideas about ways to shape your portfolio, whether you're uh, more experienced artists or you're just getting started it all still applies uh down the road yeah just like like uh these guys are saying thanks for the opportunity i i know we couldn't get to all of your guys's questions there's some good ones in there as well i will answer them in some way <laughs> like <laughs> yeah. someone someone will help us but yeah, uh, follow up stream Jeremy's got like all of my know, stream. <laughs> this this great dynasty Discord that like people are super interactive in there. If you haven't checked it out before and answering all kinds of questions and just uh, uh, even like reviewing portfolios on your own YouTube channel, like just kind of oh, plug in that like like check out check out the Discord, check out um, Dynasty and all all the GDD podcasts. Uh, there's some great stuff. Also, a follow up on that as well. Um, with the RSH learning being free over Christmas breaks, I've really, if you're looking to get into the industry and you want to follow that up, there's some really good tutorials Super on there good. and talks. You have um, Patrick Ziegler talking about working um, remote in your first day in studio. Kieran Goodson has one of the best pieces of content for um, game art applications, um, texturing tutorials. So if you're looking to get into, into it, RSH learning is free right now. Like There's so much good content on there. It's worth checking out. Thanks so much again. And uh, thank you, everyone. We'll see you all again yeah, soon. Thank you. All right. See ya.